Hello and welcome to section one of the Introduction to Erlang Programming course by the EC Council. This section is titled Getting Started. This video will focus mainly on the Erlang shell, which will be our main tool for running Erlang code moving forward. Before we start, a refresher for some of our assumptions. First of all, even when you can follow the training using Erlang on Windows, that usually requires some tricks and workarounds here and there that I will not show. So, the upcoming lessons will be focused only on Linux or Mac. In your favorite operating system, you need to have Erlang OTP 23 or newer already installed. If you don't have it, I recommend you to install it using curl. Finally, maybe not today, but starting with the next section, we will use a text editor quite intensively. I recommend you to get familiar with your favorite one and have it already prepared for you. With that said, let's talk about today's lesson. What I will show you today is how to boot up an Erlang shell and how to use it to evaluate simple expressions. Then I will show you how you can learn about the extra functionality that comes with it. We will learn how to write and compile our first Erlang module from within the shell. And finally, a very important lesson, we will learn how to get out of the Erlang shell itself. Let's jump into it. This is my regular terminal. To start an Erlang shell, I need to use the command L. That command boots up an Erlang virtual machine and it will first print out information about it. For instance, it tells us that we are running on Erlang OTP version 23, and among other things, that we are using a 64-bit architecture. Then the shell itself starts, and it gives us a command prompt. Using that command prompt, we can start typing expressions that the virtual machine will evaluate, and the shell will print the result. We can type, for instance, any mathematical expression. It's worth noting that all expressions in Erlang must finish with a period. So, to compute 1 plus 2, we need to write 1 plus 2, period, and hit return. Of course, we can also make mistakes. In this case, I typed an arithmetically incorrect expression, and once I hit return, the shell will show me that error. Besides math expressions, we can use all the functions from the Erlang standard library. It's called OTP. For instance, we can use the function local time in the module calendar to get the current local time. To do that, we type calendar colon local time parenthesis and as usual, we finish the expression with a period. The parentheses are there to indicate the arguments of the function, in this case, none. Now you might be wondering what are those numbers on the left side of the prompt. They are used to keep track of all the expressions evaluated in a particular shell. Using them, you can recover a previous value, for instance, the value of expression number 3, using this function. But you can also re-evaluate a previous expression using the function e. This is very handy for functions with side effects. You can also print out the whole history of the shell using the function h with no argument. It's worth noting that when printing the history, the shell skips the periods. So if you want to copy and paste, you have to add them yourself. You can also use Ctrl R to go back to the previous incarnations of some commands, like this. But that's just a tiny, tiny fraction of all you can do within the shell. To find more about the rest of the available commands, 
you can use the function help with no arguments. Let's focus on two of the functions displayed here in particular. With the command m, you can get information about a module. For instance, if you want to get information about the module calendar, you use calendar as an argument to the function m. Among other things, this command will print out the list of exported functions in that module. And as you can see, the function local time with no arguments is in that list. Now, if you want to know what local time does, you can use the command h with two arguments, one for the module and one for the function. As you can see, the shell then prints out the specification for the function, in this case stating that there are no arguments and it returns a daytime, and a proper description of it. That's great, but eventually you will want to write your own modules. To do that, let's jump to our favorite text editor, in my case Sublime Text, and write the smallest possible module. The only required piece of an Erlang module is its module declaration, which is preceded by a dash and the word module. In this case, my module will be called my mod. And that's it, that's a valid module. But since Erlang is not an interpreted language but a compiled one, we need to compile it before we can use it. For that, we go back to the shell. First, we need to make sure that the file is actually in our path. We can do that without leaving the shell using the command ls. There it is. So we can now compile it using the command c with the name of the module. The result ok my mod indicates that the module was actually compiled and now we can use it. For instance, we can retrieve information about it using m as we saw before. We can even use the shell's autocomplete functionality by typing my mod colon and pressing the tab key. Even when we didn't define any function in our module, the Erlang compiler always adds two called module info with zero arguments and another version with one. We can try one and it will return what the function m printed out nicely before. It's the same information, but now it's actionable and before it was only printed out. All right. When we have enough of the shell, we will want to get out of it. There are many ways to get out of an Erlang shell. One way, the cleanest one, is to stop the virtual machine cleanly using the function stop in the module init. Let's check it out. It's the same as stop and it basically shuts down every application that's running on the virtual machine, including the shell, and returns to the terminal. We can stop the virtual machine not so cleanly if something is going wrong. We can use the function halt, like this. There is a lot of information in that help, but basically what Erlang Halt does is it breaks the virtual machine entirely and terminates with the status that we provide as a parameter. If we don't provide any parameter, it terminates with status zero, like successfully. All right, but what happens if the virtual machine is stuck or if we cannot type any commands in the shell or something like that? There is a way to get out of the virtual machine anyway. To do that, we press Ctrl G and that takes us to user switch mode. 
in user switch mode, we can type some commands. And in particular, the command h will give us the list of all the commands that we can use. There are not that many, but they can take care of stopping and starting the shell or other processes. But more importantly, the command q will take us out of the virtual machine. And that's it. We are back into our terminal. In today's video, we started an Erlang shell. We evaluated multiple expressions on it. We learned how to understand the results, how to navigate through the shell history, and how to learn what we can do with it. We compiled our first module in the same shell, and then we learned how to leave the shell and go back to our terminal. In the next section, we will start using Erlang for real, creating the very first modules and writing our first functions. I hope to see you there.